15 years old. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, he and I have worked on lots of records, but one we made here in Toronto called 10 Easy Pieces, which was really the kind of renaissance of my career. And these last two albums on E1, which are, are Nashville, uh, Nashville projects, the very, very best Nashville musicians. And then a lot of friends of ours who dropped in, as you can see. Yeah. yeah. This this album is a celebration of, of your of your great career. Uh, the, the album CD is called Still Within the Sound of My Voice and features, as you uh, just heard there, I love it also, uh, Joe Cocker, uh, Art Garfunkel, and Carly Simon. And Carly Simon came around at a, at a, at a time uh, in your life when you were pretty much close to the bottom. Well, she was... Uh, <laughs> As it happens, I was um, I was in Mother's Vineyard and I was hanging out at Freddie's place, he has a place up there, and um, I was I had all the blinds down and I had a couple of bottles of Jack Daniels. <laughs> uh, yeah, I had uh, I had closed a lot of doors. I I knew that I was facing a divorce, mm -hmm. and. Um, I don't know exactly how it happened, but one morning there was a big horn honking in front of the house, and I went over and looked out, and there was a uh, Land Rover, and I just sort of waved, go away, you know. <laughs> and she, the horn kept honking, and I went outside and looked through the window, and it was Carly, <laughs> you know, with this big Carly Simon smile on. And... Uh, she kind of uh, took me under her wing, took me over to her place, made me some coffee. And they, we had, uh, actually we had tea. We had tea in the garden. And um, it was a save. It was a definite save. Yeah. Was, uh, I, I don't know where, where I was headed that day. But I ended up at her house, which was a really, really good thing. Yeah. And there's a... And there's a great relationship with uh, Linda Ronstadt in these tunes, and even the one that Carly Simon covers. Right? Yeah, um, um, let's see, um, easy for you to say, mm -hmm. uh, was a top ten country adult, adult contemporary hit with Linda Ronstadt. And um, uh, I don't have Linda Ronstadt anymore. Linda's not I know. Singing, which is it's really awful. tragic. It, for me, it was like taking a bullet when Linda an, I announced her retirement. And she and I are close. And uh, I thought, well, I'll go to Carly with this, and this will be the right way to do it. And it was. It was exactly the way to, the right way to do it. On, on our first album, there were, there were two in this series. They're like brother and sister. The first one was... Uh, just Across the River, which Freddie also did. And Linda was still singing. She came in and she did a duet on uh, OK. It gets a little convoluted, but Artie Garfunkel had a hit with All I Know. Sure. Top 10. Sure, huge. And so we did All I Know, Linda and I, as a little duet. Very simple with just a guitar. And it was one of, I think, one of the most affecting and sweetest performances of her of her life. And unfortunately, as it would turn out, these are not the kind of milestones that you want to lay claim to and say, well, here's a reason to buy the album, blah, blah, blah. But as fate would have it, it looks like that might have been her last yeah. recorded performance. I think, the, I mean, not just the, the, the musical community, I think just in community in general were stunned to hear that, that she had to go into retirement. Well, her voice is so powerful and recognizable. Yeah. I mean, you could... But she's a young woman. Uh, you know, you could you could walk into a some kind of a bar in Bangkok, Thailand, and they have a jukebox in the back, and hmm. Linda, Linda would be singing on it. It was, yeah. a, it was a global voice. It was easily... It was, she was a powerful girl. She was a powerful woman, and we never thought, in some psychological cranny of our, of our beings, 
we never thought we would see the end to that. But mm -hmm. suddenly, it just shows you how things can change so suddenly. Jimmy Webb uh, is my guest in studio. His latest CD is called Still Within the Sound of My Voice. We're going to take a break. We've got to update some traffic here. When we come back, anything you want to hear specifically from this? Oh, well, I'd We're taking requests today. Well, I'd, I'd <laughs> love to hear Still Within the Sound of My Voice with, with Sarah Joyce, uh, uh, a.k.a. Rumor. Uh, that's, All right. the, that's the title song. I think that might be... You know, appropriate. Appropriate. Yeah. Yeah. All right. That's Good choice. Cut five, by the way. All right. We're back in, in a moment. More with Jimmy Webb. Stick around. It's 145 in News Talk 10. And first, this is time to save your traffic for you. Portland East Bend Express. Okay. Okay. We'll get rid of these commercials. The title track from Jimmy Webb's latest CD, Still Within the Sound of My Voice, uh, with uh, Sarah Joyce, also known as Rumor. You, uh, you say that this is... Um, uh, refer to this song as uh, almost almost unsingable. What do you mean by that? Well, it's... It's, it's just, uh, uh, it's the range? It's rangy, and, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we, didn't, we didn't really get into the... We weren't crossing the Alps yet. <laughs> <laughs> when, when, you, when you faded us out, uh, Hannibal still had to take the elephants okay. and, 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 and march over the Alps. Uh, but... Uh, Again, he, we we're talking about Linda Ronstadt. You know, she's she she seems to be here even though she's not here. Did she cut that? Uh, Glenn cut it. Didn't she cut it? She had an amazing range. She had about a five octave range. Wow. And she barely made the top note. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> Glenn, Glenn could sing it. Glenn could sing anything. <clears throat> I mean, he, I, I don't want to necessarily put it in the back, past tense, but he can sing anything. And that top note was, that, that was as high as he could sing. Um, I, um, I think I, I had done it in terms of, of setting up a, a, a sort of a obstacle course for a vocalist. You know, you yeah. start with the lowest note you can possibly sing and finish with the highest <laughs> note you can possibly sing. Were you out to try to punish someone? <laughs> yeah. Well, I just punished myself because I sang every note in that Yeah, film. right. And there were nights in the studio and I was just banging my head against the wall saying, why did you ever write this thing, you stupid? <laughs> well, you know, what's, what's interesting, uh, where did you find this harmonic and melodic inspiration? I mean, from the beginning. From the, did, was this just from listening to radio, or were you trained in this, or, or were you just tearing songs apart, Tim Pan Alley, everything, well, to come up with this magnificent I was, style? I had a lot of curiosity. I was interested in all kinds of music. I stress that, because I think that all musicians should be interested in what music, not just mm -hmm. one kind of music, but just music, that big thing out there. Um, <clears throat> but... Um, my mother put me on the piano bench when I was six years old. Mm -hmm. She was quite driven in regard to me becoming the church pianist. My father was the minister, and I was going to be the pianist. And so I was on that piano bench for six years, and then I, I was taking lessons for six years, and then at 12 years of age, I took my place on the piano bench. I was the church pianist. At 12? At 12. Wow. wow. And my mother thought that that was the pinnacle of show business. <laughs> <That> was it. <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't get any higher than that. And, and Do you uh, pick up many <laughs> chicks as the church pianist, by the way? <laughs> Not that many. Not that many? No. Now, was there, there a choir in, in, involved? In, oh, so yes. So you, you had to be working with voices right from the beginning, yes. so you had an understanding of what singing was about. And I love classical music, right. so my secret, down where I came from in, in, in Oklahoma, um, you know, you, you didn't want people to know that you listened to classical music. Not in my crowd, right. you know. But... I like the big bands. We were just talking about the big mm -hmm. bands yeah. a little bit. I used to play, I played the trumpet years and when I was in high school, and I used to drive around with, like, a, a, back when we had CDs. I know, not before CDs, we had 8-tracks with a Glenn Miller 8-track, and I'd be playing it. And most of the people in my high school were looking, are you all right? 
I said, man, you kids is fabulous music. I would listen to the Glenn Miller Band, and I would listen to the Dorsey Band. Yeah. And I also loved the Jimmy Lunsford Band. Well, one of the best, huh? And I would go, how did they get that sound? Now, that, that's to answer your question. Yeah. That's the, that's the elemental, the first question that comes is, how do, even when you're seven years old, you're eight years old, how do they get that sound? Right. And so, because I was very, very curious, I set out to learn how they got that those That combination songs. of horns yeah. and all that tight harmony. And I, I was lucky enough when I was a young kid to hear a big band live a couple of times. Now, that's another experience. Mm. I heard Buddy Rich wow. live. And the sound was hitting me in the chest. It was going right through me. Before I'd ever heard a big rock band or anything like that, I thought, how much noise? How did they get all that noise out of a few guys? Sitting? And you know, I got interested in orchestration. So what happened when you put pen to manuscript? What was the first thing that came out of the gate? Oh. Drum roll. <laughs> yeah, I know a drum roll, but I mean something, you know, that you got a song around and people covered it. Uh, well, I wrote a song when I was 13 years old in Oklahoma City called uh, Someone Else um, that eventually a appeared on an Artie Garfunkel album, even though I, 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 uh, I sort of forced him to put in parentheses 1957. Because I didn't, I really considered there were a lot of technical problems with that. That I, and I just didn't want it to be thought to be current. Um, but by the between thirteen and seventeen, I had probably amassed thirty or forty songs that I would. It's incredible that I could it play. Is. And if I talk to young writers and they say, "What do I need to do? Just tell me what the secret is," I would say, "Well, this is really complicated now. So hold on to this." And don't tell anyone else, but write lots of songs. Because <laughs> <laughs> my only secret was I wrote lots of songs. Right. So if somebody said to me, hey, can you play us a song about this or a song about that? I mean, chances were I could probably do it. Yeah. You know. The great Jimmy Webb, uh, still within the sound of my voice, his latest uh, CD, a celebration of, of his tremendous uh, career, appearing this evening at Hugh's Room. Very quickly, because we're already running late, if you had to pick one song that you wanted to be uh, remembered for, what would it have been? Maybe The Moon is a Harsh Mistress. Okay, which is on the CD. Yeah. We're probably going to have to play that. Next time you come here, I want to ask you, what the hell is MacArthur Park all about? <laughs> <laughs> You won't get an answer. <laughs> <laughs> it's a real pleasure meeting you. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very All much. Best. Jimmy Webb. Thank you. Absolutely. It is 2 o'clock in Toronto. Shortly thereafter, coming up, it's uh, Charles and Butler. Stick around. God, that was the fastest half hour in the world. Holy mackerel.